Hello, and welcome everybody to the second dental therapy CE. My name is Katie LaVisca. Little change of plans. I will actually be hosting tonight, so you get to look at my lovely face some more and hear me talk. Very exciting. Um, the first CE kind of centered around a lot of how dental therapy began, how it's grown over the past 10 years, where it is today, especially in the country. And at the end, we had some time um, for some questions and we actually went over in our Q&A session, which was amazing. We had like 60 attendees. It was so invigorating and rejuvenating just, you know, to be talking about dental therapy. And even though we've been doing it, you kind of get stuck in your little bubble. So this session, um, we're going to focus a lot more on asking questions, especially to dental team members. We actually have like a billing specialist. We have Dr. Quinlan again here with us today, some other great um, advanced dental therapists. So please um, feel free to use that um, Q&A folder that Joe was referencing. We'll try to answer questions um, throughout the session, but then we'll have time at the end also uh, to answer questions live. So uh, to start off with, I'm just going to let the panel introduce themselves because they'll be much better at it than I will. Um, again, I'm Katie LaVisca. I'm an advanced dental therapist. I currently work for Southside Dental Clinic in Southern Minneapolis. I was part of the first dental therapy class back in 2011, graduated from the University of Minnesota and have traveled around the country speaking on behalf of dental therapy. And as you can tell, I'm very passionate about it. And so to forward this on. Um, let's go to Heather Lubin, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, please. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. My name is Heather Lubin. Um, I am a 2011 graduate from Metropolitan State University. I was in the first class of dental therapists for Metropolitan State University. I was a dental hygienist before that. I began my career in dental hygiene in 2002. Um, working at a private practice until 2008 um, when I began working for Apple Tree Dental. Um, and that is my current employer. I've worked for them um, since 2008. And I has became a dental therapist in early 2012. I began practicing and an advanced dental therapist since 2013. Um, I work three to four days a week in our Moundsview Clinic for Apple Tree and one day a week with our mobile program out at our community sites, um, whether it's long-term care or um, a pediatric medical clinic is my most common mobile site right now. Great, um, Sandra, why don't you go ahead and follow after Heather here? Great. Hi, I'm Chandra Stafford. I'm the office manager of the Apple Tree Dental Mounds U Center. Um, and I've worked for Apple Tree for 16 years now. And I've just had the great pleasure of working with Heather since she joined Apple Tree in 2008. <clears throat> yeah. Great. Thank you. Dr. Quinlan, would you mind reintroducing yourself for the second panel? Not a problem. Uh, as Katie said, I'm Dr. Brian Quinlan. I've been in uh, dentistry uh, for 35 years this June, I'll have graduated. Um, proud to embrace the age at this point, might as well not fight it. Uh, I've been in community health since 2008, late 2008. Uh, so it's been quite a part of my career, but roughly about a third. Uh, the other places I was before that, uh, were quite a mix of um, locations and settings. So I've had quite a bit of um, exposure to the different needs of the um, population that will come to a community health center. Great, thank you very much. And I think Christy is on with us now. I am, it will not allow me to start the video. It says you guys have it blocked. So anyway, my name is Christy Jo Fogarty. <laughs> um, I've been a dental therapist. I actually graduated the same year as Heather and Katie. So I was in the first class in 2011, um, was a dental hygienist for several years before that and a dental assistant before that. So I'm a, a true example of career laddering and much like Katie and Heather um, have done a lot of national speaking and championing for dental therapy and and oftentimes you can't shut me up. So I, I appreciate the opportunity again to get to, to brag on our profession and, and tell other people what a great experience it is. 
Yes. Chrissy is who I go to when I need dental therapy help. So she is a very, <laughs> very uh, great advocate for dental therapy. And we're so blessed to have her. I mean, she's even served on the Minnesota Board of Dentistry. So she is um, amazing and we love her. Um, and I think Jody has just joined us also. Um, she, I believe, will be our last panelist. Jody, if you could unmute yourself and um, introduce yourself, that would be amazing. We can come back. Got my camera going. <laughs> yes, very pretty. Okay, we'll work on Jody. When you can um, unmute, just let me know and we'll have you introduce yourself. But we're gonna um, start actually just the question sessions now. So I have about 13 questions we're gonna go through. Um, if your question is not answered in there, we're gonna be looking at the QA folder also during that time. And I'm willing to stay afterwards too and help answer questions. If not, I will get your information and make sure that we answer your questions. We want the correct information spread about dental therapy. I'm sure Jody and Christy mm -hmm. can also reference to the fact that in traveling, there can be a lot of miscommunication and misinformation about dental therapy and how it's functioning in Minnesota out there. Um, so we just want to make sure that we get everybody's questions answered correctly. So. Okay, um, we're going to kind of start with just the basic questions of why did your dental office decide to include dental therapists and when did this process start? Um, Dr. Quinlan, would you mind starting with this one? I'd be happy to. So I decided to add dental therapy at a different community health center, FQHC, in 2013. I had learned about uh, dental therapy had quite a full staff at the time, but as uh, practic practically speaking, things would go, getting dentists were getting hard to come by and some were leaving and I needed providers. And I had wanted to hire a therapist much sooner, but uh, again, it wasn't available. So um, basically uh, I just decided, okay, I need a provider. And uh, I had gotten a lot of training from um, the University of Minnesota on what dental therapy was about. Uh, the director had given a program, uh, an introductory program, and then had basically a, a job bank type of thing where the therapists went around to the different potential employers. And uh, it, was, it was a very eye-opening experience. Great. And then you, uh, they started at Southside. I started at Southside in uh, March of 2017. So we're getting close to four years there. Awesome. And immediately I started seeking dental therapists to be on staff. Uh, in fact, the administration there had already located one and uh, we kept ads uh, out there so that we could get even more. Uh, and now we have five. Five, yeah, I mean, I can't even keep track, so. <laughs> Just very, very, very awesome. Thank you. Uh, Christy Jo, would you mind going? Sure, like I said before, I was in the first class at Metro State um, University. Um, there were um, several of us in this class, that class, and most people already had a job waiting for them, but I was one of the two who kind of took a le leap of faith in the practice that I was working at, I knew was not going to hire me when I was done. Um, but I was able to secure a job started in August of 2011. So almost all of us are going on 10 years, which just seems crazy because that means I'm getting really old. But um, overall, um, it's kind of amazing that, it, that it's gotten that quick. Um, our clinic absolutely wanted to hire um, dental therapists to help expand access to care. Um, most public health offices struggle to find um, dentists who um, A, are interested in working in public health and B, stay there for a long term. And um, so they were very excited about being able to do um, uh, expand access to care. And we've really been able to expand how much care we can do. So in, in, our, in our clinic, they figure about every year, we save about $45,000 for having a dental therapist versus having a dentist in that position. And that's not to say we replace dentists with dental therapists. We're constantly recruiting dentists. We're constantly recruiting dental therapists. Um, but with the savings that we have been able to do by hiring multiple dental therapists, we've been able to expand the amount of care that we've been able to provide um, for the children that we see. So 
it's been great for us. So awesome. Yeah, I was um, actually able to see Christy Jo work at one of her setups in a school, and it was just amazing how she was able to just further increase access to care just by bringing everything into the school and seeing multiple children a day. It was just eye-opening. Yeah, it's one of the great advantages of what we have is that uh, we bring the, we bring the care right to the children, right to the children, and then as you'll hear with Heather, they do the exact same thing, mm -hmm. um, and and breaking down a lot of those barrier access to barrier things, right? Transportation, language, um, right? Going right into their school, we pull them right out of class, do the dental work, send them right back to class. They maybe miss an hour of of, of education, um, but it doesn't involve their parents pulling them out of school for a half a day, which may be four or five hours, and sometimes never returning to the classroom for the day, and possibly missing an entire day of school. Um, so we really try and break down those barriers. Parents don't have to worry about transportation. They don't have to worry about language barriers. There's always translators around in the schools and in, in our organization. So you're even missing work and having to travel. So yeah, it's absolutely. Very, Which very is impossible for some parents. Yeah. Very awesome. Yeah. It was, it was so fun to see you in action. It was neat. Um, Heather and, um, I keep saying your name wrong. Chandra. I'm close. I know I'm close. <laughs> Chandra is correct. Chandra. Yep. Chandra is how you say it. <laughs> um, so like I said, I have worked at Apple Tree since 2008. And so that's kind of when the legislation was beginning. And our CEO, Dr. Mike Hel Helgeson, and the organization in general um, were big supporters of the legislation. Um, so we were kind of involved with helping get that legislation passed. And so I don't think they ever considered not hiring a, de um, a dental therapist after that. Uh, we do have eight locations and Jody Hager, who is on, I believe, um, she was actually part of our first graduating class as well. And both of us were working for Apple Tree at the time. Um, I was at our Coon Rapids clinic and she was at our Moundsview clinic. And so, or at our uh, Medelia clinic, sorry. And so we both transitioned right into um, our role as a dental therapist after we graduated. Um, so, Oh, sorry, I knew I was gonna say something else. Um, we have eight locations now and we have 10 dental therapists um, working for Apple Tree. That is awesome. I didn't know it was that many. That's so great. Yeah. Okay, very cool. And then Jody, I know you're unmuted now. We can't see you, but that's okay. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself? And then um, we're just starting the question portion. Uh, why did your dental office decide to include a dental therapist? And when did you start? Yeah, um, and I apologize. This is, uh, I'm not super computer savvy and the whole Zoom thing is, is throwing me a little. I just, and I just got home, so. Um, it took me a little bit to get going. So if you tell me how to get my face on here, I certainly will put it on. Um, but yeah, my name's Jody Hager. I graduated with Christy and Heather, um, worked for Apple Tree. I'd been working for Apple Tree for 16 years. Um, as I started as an ass Ooh, We lost you. <laughs> Jody's also rural, so she <laughs> yes, she was. <laughs> Jody's also rural. I think we lost you, Jody. Um, okay, maybe we'll come back, but I know Heather and Christy can also speak um, to a lot of what Heaven said there. Also, so that's great. Um, okay, we're just going to move on to question two. Uh, from your perspective, what are the important aspects of your collaborative management agreement between the dental? Just and Ms. You, Lynette Ingswick, yeah. that called me and and uh, she said you've got to get involved in this. And um, she knew I liked public health, and so yeah, it just kind of went from there. Okay, Jody, I think we heard about. Oh, I see my face now. <laughs> okay, can you? We can. There you are. Oh, okay. There you There's Jody. You might be breaking up a little bit. So I think we heard about okay. a, a fourth of that. Um, okay. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's all good. Not a problem. All right. I did uh, mention I'm in a rural area, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very rural Minnesota. Um, we're going to move on to question two. Uh, from your perspective, what are the important aspects of your collaborative management agreement between dentists and dental therapists, and why is a CMA important? Um, let's go with um, Heather 
And uh, Chandra, do you mind starting that one? Sure. Um, so the Collaborative Management Agreement or the CMA is uh, it's just a basic guideline of the dental therapist or advanced dental therapist scope of practice and supervision levels. Um, I am able to provide my full scope um, of practice under general supervision. So essentially my CMA is just going to outline that. It'll also outline some guidelines and protocols on certain things such as um, you know, reviewing medical histories, quality assurance, that sort of thing. Um, but the document itself kind of allows a dental therapist and a dentist um, to sit down and you, you sign off on it yearly and you discuss the scope, the supervision levels, everybody's comfort level, um, and have all of that documented. Chrissy Joe. Um, yeah, I mean, Heather did a great job of summarizing what, what a collaborative management agreement. It does a great job of defining what people can and can't do. Sometimes dentists will put limitations in it. Um, we've not found that to be very common, but now and then, and sometimes when they're first starting out, they will. Um, for me, the most important pieces that are in there that's very important to me is um, standing orders for us. That's, that, that allows me to function within my full scope of practice as an advanced dental therapist. I don't need to stop what I'm doing and I can continue with treatment because of those standing orders, which is fantastic. And for me, another big piece of it is written right into that is, is a required um, annual um, chart review, which if nothing else, because uh, especially in my organization where we are headquartered in Northeast Minneapolis, um, but very rarely am I at that location. Quite often, I will go months on end being at our remote locations. We have um, 700 locations statewide and about 400 in the metropolitan area, different partners that we work with, Head Start schools, community centers. Um, so it's, it's very uncommon to see me at our headquarters. It's very uncommon to see me at one of our brick and mortar buildings. Um, usually I'm at one of our partner sites. Um, so with that being written right into that agreement, it, it forces me and my dental, um, my collaborating dentist to sit down and have a conversation at least once a year and to make sure we're still real unified in how we treatment plan and how we want to approach care and, um, and when we should be referring and when we shouldn't be referring and making sure because as you're a practitioner and you know, um, you're always growing, you're always learning, you're always changing your philosophies on things and, and I think COVID 20, 20, the year of 2020 sure Sure, let us all reevaluate how we practice, right? So sitting down and going through the charts is, is a great way for us to reconnect and, and really make sure that we're on the same page. Great, thank you, that was awesome. And I know um, for some of those of you out of state that are possibly looking at implementing dental therapy or if you're just starting, yes, when we first graduated, the CMA for some reason was this big blah moment um, and everyone was kind of confused about it and it, we were discussing with the board and everyone had just graduated and then there was this like light bulb went off and they're just like oh it's just like a collaborative agreement that you would sign with a hygienist and the board has the Minnesota Board of Dentistry website has an outline for you to follow what's required for you to have within the CMA we have to renew every single year. We do it online. It's very, very simple. Um, and then you renew with each dance that you sign with. So it's very streamlined. So once people realized that it was just, it was already commonplace and it became much less of an issue initially. And I've gotten some questions from other states about the same way. And I kind of have to tell them the same thing. Like it's just the agreement that you're signing with your dentist. You're going to renew it every year. It doesn't have to be a big issue. It just outlines your scope of practice. And like Christy Joe said, very often we're not finding any limitations to the scope of practice. Possibly just once they get their advanced certification, they might be closely closer monitored for like two months before they practice under a general supervision or something like that. So um, Jody, do you have anything to add about the CMA? Um, yeah, the CMA for between Dr. Brown and I is, um, it's just, I guess it kind of holds us accountable to each other, makes us uh, sit down and go over things. And so that's kind of a good thing. Um, it helps us to outline exactly what each, each person is expecting and what's expected of them. And so I guess um, I, I do have to pull it out every once in a while and go over it again and, and refresh my memory on different things. And it, I just think it's an important thing to have. 
Yeah, and then traveling to other states is a big question too, but it's mostly when Dennis here, you know, that you can limit the scope of practice, it tends to alleviate some of the fears. But then again, when you realize kind of how limited the advanced dental therapy, dental therapy scope of practice is, um, then it becomes much less of an issue also. Um, Dr. Cullen, I don't know if you had anything to add. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that um, it might have been because I was new to dental therapy and I was one of the people that was saying, okay, what's this about? What do we do? Um, I found that I spent a lot of time just working with the, the dental therapists. They weren't advanced at that point. And the discussions by themselves were for me sufficient enough to know what they can do, what they can't do. We talked a lot about it, which is something I think is very advisable is to, uh, always understand what dental therapy is about, know what changes might be coming from the board of dentistry. And therefore, I'm not gonna say any of the points are invalid. It just for me personally, because I was very active in finding out what it was about, what they could do, what they understood, uh, what they wanted to learn, that uh, we were in very good communication anyway. Right. And I, I think it helps a lot of practitioners to know that like our um, board examination, our patient board examination is the exact same as the dental students were graded the exact same. There's a blind proctor, so they don't know if they're grading a dental student or a dental therapy student. Our mannequin portion is a little bit different because we greatly encompasses pediatrics in our, so they had to make a mixed type it on and all that really fun stuff. And all that can be found on the Minnesota Board of Dentistry website. Also, or we can send you information if you have more questions about that. And I mean, we get the exact same training as the dental students and the dental hygiene students do in school. So I think that also helps alleviate some of those concerns and fears. If nobody has anything else to add to the CMA um, question, I will move on to the third one. Good, okay. How is the integration of a dental therapist within your office been communicated to your community and to your patients? How do patients know when they're seeing a dental therapist? Is that communicate, communicated? Ha, how have you gotten word out to your community about dental therapy? Um, Jody, do you wanna start? Yeah, um, so I, I just make sure that I introduce myself when I come in. And when I started in Dr. Brown's clinic, he has a fairly established patient population. And so I've been there almost three years now and so most of them know that I'm a dental therapist. I oftentimes have to explain what a dental therapist is, um, but most of them now kind of know. And um, the staff themselves, well, I, I hear the hygienists all the time say, well, our dental therapist, Jody, is gonna come in and take a look at your teeth. And um, the assistants too um, talk about, they, they use the dental, the, the word dental therapist a lot with the patients. So it's becoming fairly well known in our clinic anyway. Great. Uh, Heather. Sure. Um, so when I was graduating, um, I had put together for my capstone, capstone project, um, a presentation discussing integrating dental therapists into the dental team. And so first I sat down before I even graduated and started working um, as a dental therapist, I sat down with um, the staff at Apple Tree and did that presentation and kind of discussed like, this is, you know, what I've been going to school for. This is what a dental therapist is, what we can do, how it works, um, how we can be a part of the dental team. Um, and then I have a profile card, um, as do all of the providers at Apple Tree. So it's kind of your business card with your picture and it discusses, you know, your education, your interests, um, all of that good stuff. And then on the back of mine and other dental therapists, it will, oh, Chandra's got it. <laughs> it will discuss um, what a dental therapist is and our scope of practice and all of that. So that was kind of our, our main um, way of introducing it to our patients. Um, similar to Jody, that's when the hygienists get me for an exam. They're just like, oh, here's our advanced dental therapist, Heather. She's going to do your exam. Um, or if a dentist is planning an appointment and they are booking out or they want the patient to see the dental therapist, they'll kind of say that to the hygienist or the assistant um, and the patient and just say, 
you know, your other option is to see our dental therapist. You might have a little more um, flexibility getting in, that sort of thing. Um, and then once in a while, patients will ask more in-depth questions for the most part. And I always introduce myself. I'm one of the dental therapists here. My name's Heather. Um, but for the most part, patients um, don't ask too many questions. They just want to get some care. Christy, anything you want to add? I, 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 no, I think I want to steal Heather's card idea, though. That's fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. We, we run, um, because we work in, in children's dental, dentistry, um, our scope of practice is very well suited. Um, so there's not a lot that our dental practitioners do um, that we don't. Um, so the delineation is really just at the scheduling point for the most part. Um, like I said, though, I'm not at our brick and mortar offices very often. So we rely on our partners to help communicate some of that information. Um, so they know a dental therapist is coming and they, they expand that out to um, their, pa their, their patient base as well that we'll be working with, uh, specifically the Head Start kids. Um, and just like Jody and Heather said, as I walk in the room, I always introduce myself. Um, and, and like I said before, you, you can't shut me up about being a dental therapist. So I never miss an opportunity to make sure I tell someone I'm a dental therapist. Um, but that's really how we do it. It's, it's a lot more informal than it sounds like, but I'm, I'm kind of given that information card. I think, I think that's going to get run through, run up the flagpole at my work. That's a great <laughs> idea. Cause I think that they would like to know more about it. Um, but I, I, my experience is much like Heather's. I don't get a lot of questions. The people are tremendously grateful for care from an experienced practitioner. Um, I don't think they really care too much about the alphabet soup behind our, behind our names. Yeah, I know some offices um, use scripting. So they'll give their front desk receptionist an actual script on how to introduce a dental therapist and what they do because often even staff, especially newly hired, isn't all that familiar um, with the occupation. I think I can speak for all of us when I say that patients are fine, especially when you kind of compare it to a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant, you know, this is what we do, this is what we're trained for. I, the patient acceptance of it has been very wide and very broad, and we haven't seen an issue with that. It's been more internally within the dental world that we've seen more resistance to it. It's just such a well-established medical model that um, it's just not surprising. And honestly, most of the time I get like, oh, that's awesome. Okay, you know, let's go. Um, yeah, to dovetail on that a little bit, in 10 years of practice, I've, I've had one, one parent say I'd prefer my child see a dentist, I yeah. mean, it, it, with the thousands of patient contacts, so. Yeah, and when I do have a patient that says, I want to see my dentist, I'm like, yay, that's awesome, I'm glad you found somebody that you like to see, and you want to keep your teeth fixed, like, that's great, <laughs> you know, not a problem. Uh, Dr. Quillen, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, um, at both the FQHCs that I work at, <clears throat> I made presentations uh, to all staff, and at the first one, I made presentation to just the dental staff. And uh, for the most part, it was well-received. When it came to patients, um, I guess I should just let you know that I've had several patients throughout my career say, you're the most laid back dentist I've ever run across. And so my attitude was just, yeah, I'd like you to see my dental therapist. And most people were like, what's that? And I would tell them what it is and they'd go, okay. And uh, for the ones that balked a little bit, once I had that filling done by a dental therapist, I would tell them I've had a filling done by a dental therapist. I've actually got two, to be, to be exact. Great, thank you very, very yep. much. Uh, maybe I'll get to pick on you one day, who knows? Yep, <laughs> you're next. <laughs> if nobody has anything else to add on question three, we're gonna move on to question four. What types of patients do your office dental therapists see? Are they different from your general patient population? I know in the QA section, we've actually had a lot of comments on um, FQHCs kind of and how they differ. I know they exist a lot in other states. So um, Mr. Loeffler, thank you for all of your information. I am going to try to read through it and get back to you. If Dr. Quillen has a second, he can look through the QA or FQHC um, facts too and kind of comment on that. Um, but uh, let's start with uh, Heather. Um, sorry, we're just asking if if the patients are any different from like our the patients that our dentist would see. Okay, yeah, no, we don't really differentiate um, any any difference between um, between dentist or dental therapist, unless it's scope of practice related. If it's obviously an extraction or a root canal, I won't be seeing the patient. Um, but our office 
um, I just pulled the 2016 statistics. We, in 2016, we saw 83% Medicaid, 11% private insurance, 4% uninsured and 2% sliding scale. Um, so whether it's a dentist or a, de or a dental therapist, um, every provider at Apple Tree is probably seeing a similar um, layout in, as far as um, types of patients that they're seeing in their um, payment. Great. There was a uh, question in the Q&A about FQHC. Yes, somebody asked about the encounter rate being the same for therapists and dentists. And the answer is yes, there is no variation uh, between uh, a therapist, hygienist, or dentist. And I know there's a question about that later, so I can get into more of that later. But since it was brought up now, I thought I'd uh, just mention it. Thank you. But uh, in terms of, I can answer too, in terms of patients, um, and Katie can back this up, we really don't have any delineation of patients in the office. Um, most of our patients um, are either sliding fee or Medicaid. And that is exactly the model that a therapist is made for. And I know that a lot of the therapists have swayed more towards the pedo and the dentist more towards, a, let's just say, specialty type of care. Uh, that has worked out really well, uh, especially since the therapists were pretty much made to see the children. And so it's been very helpful. I still have dentists that are very happy to see children. And uh, so it, it doesn't get spread out. We don't say that just the children go to the therapists. Uh, the, the therapist will see any type of patient, including older medically compromised patients as well. And because of the working relationships we've had, I'm very confident that if they do have any questions or concerns, they can um, come and discuss things with uh, myself or any other dentist. I bug you almost every day, so I can 100% say Oh, it's that. not bugging me. We collaborate <laughs> as often as I can with a dentist yes. you know, if we need to, but I'm fortunate to work in a clinic with a dentist. But in other clinics, I have worked under general supervision where there isn't a dentist available. So through teledentistry, you know, dental therapists are also able to utilize that tool in order to increase access to care. Um, I've worked at a few other clinics where I only see the state-based insurance population. I've been brought into clinics where they're 18 weeks pushed out um, just for operative, just for fillings. So I'll, I went in one day a week um, for two months to get them down to three-week availability. So there's a lot of different ways you can utilize dental therapy in that scope of practice. Also, in terms of not just the patient type and base, but also just the availability um, of the patients that you're seeing. Uh, Jody Christie, any comments on the, are you seeing a different type of patients than the general population? I actually, um, when I first started with Tim, um, with Dr. Brown, I was not, I was seeing pretty much across the board, um, like everybody else. He's private practice and at that time did not, um, see a lot of patients that had, that were on state programs. And um, so about a year ago, one of the reasons he hired therapy is because he wanted to do things differently. And so about a year ago, he started opening his practice up um, to more people that, that were on state programs. And, um, and so I do see most of those people. Um, but otherwise, uh, if, if, and I'll see anybody and, you know, if there's a hole in my schedule, they'll fill it. So. Great. Christy, anything to add? No, I mean, like, you know, I work in pediatric dentistry and like I alluded to before, unless it's ortho extractions or um, endo, we have one dentist that does endo and we have one dentist who will do um, some pretty significant permanent extractions. Um, it's, it's really just a mix and we just really work as a team. So I, I, it, it just kind of goes wherever it will fit and as quick as we can get kids in. Yeah. And by us practicing at the top of our scope of practice, it enables the dentist to practice at the top of their scope of practice. So they can do a lot more pros and endodontics and oral surgery and all that too. I mean, I've had one day I saw a 103 year old patient and I was, I was walking my patient out. My three year old patient was coming into my chair and we just had the biggest laugh about it. It was so fun that you could do that in, you know, one day back to back. 
Um, and it is important to um, just kind of remind everybody that uh, we are required, 50% of our patients have to be HMO MA underinsured, or we have to work in a designated underserved area as determined by the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, I do have a PowerPoint on a lot of this information, which um, my uh, email I can put in the comment section, um, or if Sai, if you still have that slide from last time, we can put that up at the end too. Um, do you want me to put it up now? Uh, we can do it at, at the end. That's fine. okay. Um, so, but I can send if you need more dental therapy information, I can send that out too. So, all right, uh, we're going to move on to question five. What have been some of the roadblocks you've encountered as a dental therapist in terms of billing and payment? So we're going to start with our billing specialist, Chandra, if you wouldn't mind taking that on. Sure, no problem. Um, so yeah, the main roadblock at first was just determining if insurances were going to consider a dental therapist as a provider who we could credential and bill claims under. Um, currently, commercial insurances, we still are billing the procedures under the collaborative provider. Otherwise, the claims are denied um, or processed out of network. Um, the Minnesota government health programs in, I believe, 2018 um, did start to recognize dental therapists as a provider we could bill services for. So since then, we have successfully been submitting all of our claims um, provided by a dental therapist to uh, the Minnesota healthcare programs. Um, the only few hiccups we've had with the Minnesota healthcare programs is just that um, there's a few procedures like limited exams that the government programs will sometimes reject as a procedure that's not in the scope of practice of a, like an advanced dental therapist. And then the other one is just um, sometimes they'll reject a claim for a pro fee because they don't recognize that an ATD is maybe duly licensed as an RDH. But in general, we really haven't had issues since the government healthcare programs have started um, accepting those claims. We're still waiting for a commercial to get their stuff together, so. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Um, when Dr. Quinlan comes back, I will ask him that question for, oh, there he is, huh? Uh, Dr. Quinlan, anything to comment um, just with the FQHCs and um, any roadblocks with the billing and payment? Uh, actually, no, uh, it's been a lot easier than uh, I anticipated. The um, manager that I had when we first brought on the dental therapist at the other office just called up um, the different uh, insurance companies that were administering the Medicaid funds as well as the Department of Human Services. And the only thing they told us is that uh, put down the therapist as a servicing provider and put the dentist as the billing provider. And basically they accepted my credentials uh, for the therapist's work. Uh, our billing specialist at the office has attempted to get the therapists uh, credentialed with private insurance companies, which put up a big roadblock there. So we didn't really expect that we'd get anywhere. She was hoping that um, the, uh, the insurance companies that administer the Medicaid would credential, but as of yet, they are not um, changing on that. I don't know a lot of the specifics behind that and why it is the way it is. Uh, in our programs, it has always worked out. Um, in We had Dentrix at first, and behind the scenes, that was automatically set to make the therapist a servicing provider and the dentist a billing provider. So that wasn't any problem. And in, now we have Epic Wisdom, and there it is something that we can manually change. And everybody has learned how to do it, uh, thanks to Katie's great tutelage and uh, everything seems to work out fine. We haven't been getting any problems with that particular part of billing. Great. Um, Christy, anything to add that you, I know you've been with Apple Trees since this all started, so. Or children, um, sorry. With children. Sorry. I, I mean, Chandra kind of covered it. When, when it started, it was tough. Like I remember our, our billing specialist had called health partners and said, how do we, you know, state the state run health partners piece. And they said, how do we build this? And they said, 
oh yeah, dental therapies, they, they keep talking about it in the legislature. We're thinking they'll pass it sometime, but until they do, we're not going to worry about it. And at the time, health partners had actually already hired a dental therapist that was working in one of their offices. So, I mean, was it, was, that? it was a... <laughs> 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 that was one of your classmates, wasn't it, Katie? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so they, they, I mean, they figured out, and, and like you said, it's very easy now, except for private insurance, which still hasn't quite got on board yet. Uh, Heather, Jody, anything to add or? Nope. Being, Billy, in, pri being in private practice, I asked, I asked our um, office manager uh, this, this week about this question and, and we just bill everything out under the dentist. Everything's because most of our, you know, we still have a fairly large private insurance population. So, yep. So, I mean, it's safe to say dental therapy is still very effective and is still um, about 60% of us work in cities, about 40% of us work in um, rural Minnesota. Again, that's just the stable locations. That doesn't include what I mean, Christy Joe and what Heather do, especially with the mobile um, units and going to different things, which is about where the state-based insurance is in Minnesota. About 60% of the uh, state-based lives in the cities, about 40% lives in rural Minnesota. So we're evenly dispersed um, as far as that goes too. But you know, I, there are currently more open positions for dental therapists in Minnesota than actual dental therapists. And so I think that speaks to a lot of how well it's working. I had three offices reach out to me this week asking to help with posting of job description of job postings because they want dental therapists. So it's not a roadblock. Um, it's been something that offices have had to learn, but now after a decade, you know, but we're, we're still working at it. Uh, very similar to when physician's assistants came out it's been about a century or so. And so now they're, you know, finally established. And so it, it takes time. I have to constantly remind myself it's only been a decade, you know, that we've been around. So we're still, still working at it. Um, moving on to question six, what are the most commonly billed procedures provided by a dental therapist? Uh, Chandra? Sure. So, um, I did just kind of run a report recently, but um, a whole lot of fillings, a lot of, we do a lot of SDF um, here, sealant, stainless steel crowns, a lot of nitrous oxide patients, a lot of the kiddos with nitrous. And then our dental therapist did a lot of our exams, uh, a lot of our recall limited exams. And then more recently, a lot of our teledentistry um, recall and limited exams and then profies and x-rays. And Heather with, produces uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. And with some numbers I ran in um, 2019 for therapy presentations, I can say the same thing for exams. Uh, actually, therapists were way out ahead of the dentists for limited and periodic exams. And, um, and, and ditto, you know, they're doing all those things and more, so... Yep, and we can do um, any restorative, it doesn't matter. I know it gets kind of confusing sometimes with the hygiene or um, assistance when they can, um, oh, what is the word I'm looking for with assistance? Baby brain, I blank. Restorative functions. Thank you, restorative function assistance can only do <laughs> so many surfaces. Um, so we can, we can do any services, any type of material, love SDF. Um, so if there's any questions about that, yep, any kind of restorative, so. Uh, Jody, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, no, we looked at the numbers this week and it's mostly exams and fillings for me. Um, I still do, um, I usually have at least one hygiene patient a day and, um, and I do a lot of LEs. And I think that's pretty common. Um, the Minnesota Department of Health did a survey back in 2019. And one of the questions was, if you're duly licensed, how often are you doing you know, hygiene as opposed to restorative? And I think it's a common theme where duly licensed, they may start very hygiene heavy and then move into dental therapy and then pretty much just end up doing a lot of dental therapy. But occasionally they, you know, either they have a dental hygiene day or they see a few dental hygiene patients um, a week. So that's the trend that we're kind of seeing right now too with the dual licensures, correct, Jody? Yeah, I would say right now we're, we're more behind in hygiene than we are restorative. And that, that varies from month to month, but right now that's where we're at. And so um, the girls up front will just, you know, they know I can do hygiene. So if they have somebody that wants to get in and I have an opening, they'll put them in there. Um, I prefer 
restorative and um, and they know that too so they do try to try to keep me pretty full with restorative yep and i've worked in clinics where i've helped with um new patient assessments also by incorporating another provider we've had to hire more hygienists we've had to hire more assistants we're you know we're creating more jobs so that's another common fear in other states you know that we're taking away people's jobs and if anything we're actually seeing the exact opposite by incorporating another provider into a clinical setting so that's been really fun. Um, if anybody has anything else to comment, if not, I will move on to our next question. How does your office decide when a patient will see a dental therapist versus a dentist? Um, I think we kind of already covered this. So we can go over it um, pretty quickly. Um, Dr. Quinlan? Well, as I try to focus on uh, dentures and extractions, uh, often when I'm in a hygiene exam, or after I've done some extractions and I know there's restorative work and I wasn't the one who diagnosed it, I will try to get it back to uh, a therapist uh, from the extraction appointments or when I'm in the hygiene, I will often suggest to see one of the therapists uh, so that my schedule stays open for the extractions and for the denture work. Other than that, uh, I think it was Christy who mentioned, yeah, we just plug people in uh, where we can so that schedules stay full and people can get in and get the work taken care of. Um, Heather, Christy? Um, I'll go. Yeah, there's not a huge clear difference in where patients are, um, are placed necessarily, like I said before. Um, typically, whichever provider um, completes the exam for patient, the patient will schedule back with them. Um, a lot of the times our hygienists will just schedule the patient right back in the room. So they'll just schedule that with whether it's me or one of our dentists. Um, if a dentist does an exam and they're booked out, like I th think I said before, or um, they might be placed with a dental therapist or another dentist, or um, if the patient has a preference or provider request, then we obviously will accommodate that. Um, if I treatment plan something during an exam that's outside of my scope of practice, I will have that patient schedule um, the procedure with one of our staff dentists or our staff specialists um, or give them an outside referral. Um, but generally, it's going to be just kind of trying to get everyone to work to the top of their license and keep the schedules full, like Dr. Quinlan said. Great. Yeah, and for us, for our, our brick and mortar sites, um, there's really not too much different, differentiation. I mean, sometimes there'll be an exam where a provider will be like, you know what, this child's going to need a little bit more of a, maybe a firmer hand or a gentler hand and, and maybe direct it to that provider if they can, because they think it'd be a better match personality wise. Um, but really who sees just for us, because we do so much um, offsite work. I mean, I literally spend 30 to 40% of my time, as you alluded to in rural Minnesota, I spend an entire week a month on the South Dakota, Iowa border um, every month. So I, I, they get who they get because that's who they send. So <laughs> sometimes it's just a matter of logistics and, and who's going to be at that site that day. Um, so, you know, we have to be a little mindful um, especially when I'm seeing adult patients, which doesn't happen too often. We do um, see some of the parents of the children we see, especially in rural areas where, where care is so limited um, that we're not, you know, scheduling, you know, extractions and things of that nature or that are permanent. But um, yeah, it has, has less to do with the title behind the name again and more to do with the availability of care. Thank you. Jody, anything to add? Uh, not really for us. It really just boils down to what's, you know, if it's in my scope, it'll be in my schedule, if, especially if I treatment planned it. Um, I oftentimes, you know, one of the challenges I've run into is that um, my dentist likes to do a lot of crowns. And so just when I treatment plan, just knowing who to refer back to him for crowns and, and what he wants specifically, we go over that quite often. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, yeah, if it's in my scope, it's in my schedule. Great. Yeah. And um, it's often brought up that my availability is a little bit better. Often the dentist, or the patient can get, you know, seen sooner if, if that's what they prefer, especially with the patient population we work with. It's often not, you know, there's one small cavity that we have to fix. It's, it's full quadrant dentistry with, um, you know, caries that can be encroaching on the pulp or getting really close. So a lot of times there's patients can't afford to wait, you know, 13, 14 weeks to get seen. So 
and it's great if the clinic's that busy. So, but just incorporating that extra provider can really help with um, access that way. Um, if nobody has anything else to add, I'll move on. How do dental therapists work with dental assistants and hygienists? What's different about these relationships as compared to dentists? Is there a difference that anybody has noticed, Heather? Um, no, I, I mean, I guess I don't have too much to say, except there really isn't much of a difference. Um, you know, just the procedures, we don't, we, we don't have as, um, as expansive of a scope. So the assistant that is working with us um, and some assistants really like that. They don't like to do extractions or um, endo. So they really prefer that. And then we have people vice versa who don't like to do fillings all day. So um, we, they will and be um, often with our specialists who are gonna be doing more of the oral surgery throughout the day. But generally the, the relationship um, isn't, isn't really any different. I can say not really. I constantly go and collaborate with a hygienist. I'm not duly licensed. So I'll go ask if what they believe the type of care that the patient needs. Um, same thing with the dentists um, and assistants. Again, usually love working with me because I just do fillings all day. So it's kind of a nice little break. Um, but I often work with different assistants and, and floats too, which can be great because it's a little less of a setup and things to, you know, learn. So that can be a useful tool also. Um, they also I appreciate little... working with you. I was going to say, Katie, they also appreciate working with you because you have those long post-ops so they can have the room clean by the time. Yeah, you're I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that the hygienists like to come to me for exams a little more often. And I think it's because I was a hygienist for so many years. I don't make them wait. No offense, Dr. Clemmer. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I never have to make the hygienists wait a little bit longer. And I tend to get up right away because I was in that chair before knowing I have like seven minutes for this doctor to do this exam. <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense. Yep. Yeah, hygienists definitely feel comfortable coming to the ADTs, you know, if they need a periodic examination, but we do have a lot of um, comprehensive examinations, so that frees the dentist yeah. up because, again, those can be five minutes, those can be, you know, 20, um, 30, just depending on the treatment plan, so helping the dentist out in that respect, too, because they'll often have, you know, a lot to do yeah. um, with the new patients, so um, if nobody has anything else to add, I'll move on. Uh, how does your dental therapist communicate with dentists regarding patient care? I think we kind of covered that. Um, we have a CM collaborative management agreement. If you work in clinic with a dentist, you can literally go and talk to them. Um, otherwise, uh, through Christy Joe, if you want to talk a little bit and Heather about the teledentistry part of it, if you do have a question or have a need, you know, on site, how do you manage that? Well, I can go first on this one. I mean, there because I am offsite and I, I am working independently, often hours and hours from the metropolitan area and our rural area. Um, I, there's many, many ways I communicate with um, not not just my collaborative dentist, but any one of the dentists. They really make themselves available to anyone um, to make sure that we get addressed quickly. Um, but I'll do phone calls, I'll do texts, I'll do emails. Um, I talked about the chart reviews that we do annually. Um, but sometimes I'll even do things like there's one dentist who's like, I'll, I'll need say a prescription for fluoride toothpaste or an antibiotic. And they're like, why don't you write the prescription in the chart? I'll review it. I'll review the medical history and I'll have my assistant call it in, or you can go ahead and print it out. Um, and, and so there's so many different ways that we find to communicate. Um, I can remember back when I first started um, and we were still taking actual physical films and, and films weren't digital. And I had a dentist, I needed a dentist to review an image for me. And I held it up to a window and took a picture of it with my camera and texted to her. And I was like, tell me who I should refer to. Should this be going to the endo? Should this be going to the oral surgeon? And so really, um, you know, bubble gum and duct tape keeps it together. And, and sometimes cell phones and windows <laughs> help us get a diagnosis. So um, really there, there's so many ways that we communicate. And I'm so grateful to the dentists who are incredibly flexible and in making sure that I'm addressed quickly so that I don't have patients waiting on the other side. So Great. No, oh, that was awesome. Thank you. Heather? Um, yeah, so my um, CMA dentist is, will sign off on any treatment plans that I make. And then we also do chart reviews every six months. 
Um, and I discuss patient care kind of like all of you with all of our staff dentists. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, Dr. Ashley. And specifically when I'm out mobile, she 99% of the time is also out mobile. And so, you know, sometimes I'm communicating with her. Sometimes I'm communicating with the dentist back at the office. Um, you know, it just kind of whoever I can get a hold of first or whoever I feel like if I want to, if I'm thinking this patient, I want to refer back to our clinic to see one of our specialists, then I'm going to try to communicate with that, that dentist or that dentist assistant to say, Hey, have them go review this patient's chart. Um, that sort of thing. Um, I often get, um, second opinions on things from other dentists, um, through, you know, whoever kind of is available, whoever's back in the office at the time, um, I ask them to review endo cases or extraction cases if so that I know if they want me to refer out or if they do feel comfortable taking the case on. Um, any comments on prescriptions? So neither DT or ADT can prescribe, but ADT can, I hope I'm saying this right, dispense, administer, provide analgesics, anti-inflammatory, no, wrong, anti-inflammatory and um, baby brain again. Uh, antibiotics is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> um, it's, it, I would say it becomes kind of an annoyance at times, but it's generally yeah. something that we can't work around. Um, it just happens like, like Prevident to have to, to tap, we send, um, through our EHR, I just send a message to any dentist who I know is probably at the clinic or who's going to check it first and just say, can you send it to their pharmacy? And that's all in there. We always assistants update the pharmacy um, right away at the beginning of every appointment. So we always should have a pharmacy, um, the correct pharmacy in there. And so we know if it's, if that is needed. Um, so it, it ends up not being as big of a deal, um, but it definitely can become an annoyance at some once in a while. Um, but yeah, there's always usually somebody who can just quick send it off. Yeah. I would say anyone who's on this call looking at legislation in their state, please, please, please let your dental therapists have prescription privileges for antibiotics and fluoride. Please. It is, it's so irritating to have to bother a dentist for something that is fairly, especially fluoride. And Paradex. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's one. Jody, anything to add? Not really. Um, Dr. Brown is the one that does all the prescriptions. And if he's not in the office, the front desk, if I have a toothache or somebody that comes in with a toothache and I feel that they need to be on an antibiotic, um, the front desk calls him. And, um, and then if he wants to talk to me, then sometimes I'll get on the phone with him and talk to him about what I'm seeing or whatever. But usually he just, he'll just do the antibiotic. He'll call it in. Dr. Quillen, anything to add before we move on? No, I think everybody covered the things I would have said, um, especially the pleading of Christy uh, <laughs> when it's a busy day and says, can you prescribe Prevident? It's like, <laughs> can really add that to my plate. But um, Why it's I've never done that. don't get me wrong, it's important. <laughs> but, um, but just to summarize, I mean, we have in-office email, we have uh, through the dental record, a messaging and a chat system. So any of those things have been very good for communication. And um, as well as Heather mentioned, uh, Katie's uh, a few times just put the prescription in there and just asked me to sign the order, had everything ready to go. So uh, it, it works very well in that respect. Awesome. We're around in the corner here. Um, how is billing insurance and government-based programs different between dentists and dental hygiene visits? Um, Chandra? Um, sure. Um, I'm not really sure exactly what the question was trying to get. I, for hygiene visits completed by an RDH, we bill under a dentist. However, you know, hygiene visits completed by an ADT or DD, D, dental therapist can be billed under the therapist for Minnesota government programs. And we always, we get paid the same, whether, you know, I don't know if that's like, was the point of the question or not, but we get paid the same, no matter which provider the claim is submitted under. I think it's a very important point. I know, again, that's a concern, um, a question that we do get a lot. So thank you for reiterating that. Um, Dr. Quillen, anything to add to that? No, um, 
you know, being in an FQHC, I don't know if all those questions have been answered, but again, the rate is the same, whether the servicing provider is um, a uh, therapist or a hygienist or a dentist. I know for the self-pay that um, uh, that's absolutely no problem there that therapists can take care and sign off the charts, the whole bit. Um, so that of course doesn't relate to the programs, but I just haven't um, seen any real differences in any of that. Uh, just the way it's set up in Minnesota, uh, when the dentist has to be the billing provider, then everything works out fine. Yeah, and anyone from out of state that's watching this, um, watching this, we, we feel your pain. Minnesota is the second most reimbursed um, state within the entire country, I believe, and we see adults and we see children. Um, I know some, and we're very privileged that we're able to do that. So we know the struggle is real and we've seen that dental therapy is a way that we can help. Um, it's a tool in your toolbox, you know, that you can use to try to help increase that access to care because it's very, very difficult um, when the reimbursement is as low as it is. So um, we'll move on then. Um, has receiving payment from a third party insurer and government-based programs been more complicated when a dental therapist was added to the mix? I know we kind of went over this, but just again, Chandra, if you wouldn't mind kind of reiterating um, any problems that you've had there. Yeah, um, yeah, really, there, there really hasn't been um, very many complications at all. Um, at this point, it's just our billing specialist just has to determine if the dental therapist or advanced dental therapist sees a patient, if they have a Minnesota government program, then they know they can submit the claim under the ADT or DT. Otherwise, if they have commercial insurance, they have to choose the collaborating provider, but it's pretty easy. <laughs> Awesome. Love hearing yeah, that. and also I would say you just have to make sure if you're dual licensed that Lynn Chandra alluded to this earlier is that if you do a profi, you need to make sure you bill it under your hygiene license because the insurers get a little confused why a dental therapist is billing for something that's not technically in their scope. But I, I, that'll that'll phase out in Minnesota because in, in the future there won't be a, a ton of dental therapists who aren't du dual licensed. Um, the only other thing we've really ran into a couple of problems is when I'm working in Southwest Minnesota, sometimes I'll have people from Iowa or South Dakota come and see us or people who are kind of have it, maybe they have one parent in Minnesota and one parent in say in Laverne and Sioux Falls. So, you know, one carries insurance or they have dual insurance. Sometimes that billing can get a little complicated. I don't know if you guys have probably run into that too. That can be a little more challenging, but I'm sure Shonda would agree. Once you have a de one dental therapist on board, and I think this is why it's so easy to, to add more dental therapists is it becomes really streamlined and it becomes really easy. That first one can maybe, you just a little learning curve, but it's much easier now and there's tons of help out there. Um, Jody, anything to add? Not really. I mean, we bill out under my dentist, so <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it's good for people to hear that, you know, it's, it's a concern that's been addressed, it's been met, that, you know, we're dealing with it, there's been some roadblocks along the way, but it's, you know, very possible, and she said easy, so I'm going to quote Chandra, so I may put that in a few of my PowerPoints, I'm not going to lie. Um, moving on, just two more questions left, and then we'll get to the Q&A. Um, have you been able to add teledentistry to your um, office, and if so, has a dental therapist been part of that practice? I think this may focus more around, especially with the COVID era, actually maybe possibly using virtual dentistry. I know we all utilize dental therapy when we're working under general supervision as in a dentist is not in the clinic. There was a question, um, I believe about like, if it's not a practice owned by a dentist, how do you bill? We are required to work for a dentist in the state of Minnesota. We can't open our own practice. We can't start our own practice. We can't do that in the state of Minnesota. I believe most states are following that principle also. Um, but has anybody been able to add teledentistry virtual dentistry? And is, has dental therapy been a part of that? Dr. Quillen? Oh, sorry, Heather. I'll get to you next. Go ahead, Heather. <laughs> Go ahead, Heather. Sorry, I've just been waiting for this question all night. <laughs> oh, this is my question. <laughs> so I'll try not to talk too much. <laughs> so Apple Tree, um, we've utilized teledentistry for almost 20 years. Um, history mostly has been hygienists going out and doing asynchronous teledentistry. Hygienists go out to community sites and do assessments and imaging. 
and then the dentist will complete an exam remotely, um, similar to what Christy and Children's Dental Services have done for many, many years too. Um, so we have had that experience for quite a long time. Um, since the pandemic began in March, uh, we developed a synchronous program and really then expanded our asynchronous services. So uh, my CMA dentist, Dr. Ashley Johnson and I were both brought back from being um, furloughed for four weeks when everything shut down in Minnesota. And one of our main tasks um, that we were given in between trying to manage emergency, emergency patients was developing these newer um, teledentistry services. Um, so we began doing the limited exams um, synchronously using Microsoft Teams, which is um, HIPAA compliant. And so Dr. Dr. Ashley and I were doing the bulk of those right away, um, kind of to establish who was a true emergency or who could be managed at home. Um, and that kind of evolved to where we don't do quite as many now that the clinic is, you know, kind of up and functioning um, fairly regularly um, now. So we're not doing quite as many of those, but we still offer them. And I still do um, I would say maybe three or four a week. And we'll, our plan is to continuously offer this option um, for patients, you know, indefinitely. Um, when we brought our hygienists back in July, we, um, I worked with them to train them to identify low risk patients who would be ideal candidates for um, teledentistry periodic exams. Um, so I've been the main provider completing those teledentistry um, periodic exams where it's similar to how we would work mobile. And so it's just, you know, limiting, limiting contact and limiting um, PPE used by having a low risk patient, having the hygienist do intraoral camera images and assessment um, and x-rays. And then I am able to complete the exam remotely. Um, either I'm at the clinic or I do, um, I'm able to even work from home at some times. I had a um, high risk COVID exposure and was out for 10 days, you know, waiting and um, I didn't have to take 10 days of PTO because I was able to actually do these exams for some of our hygienists from my house. Um, so that was really beneficial. Um, and I think Chandra said she had just pulled some of our, some of my um, production numbers and I had done, I wrote it down. I have done in the last year. So obviously this is all going to be since COVID um, 488 teledentistry periodic exams and 170 teledentistry um, limited oral evaluations. So that was my exciting news on teledentistry. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't, yeah, that was interesting for me to hear too. That's really, really cool. Awesome. Great job, Heather. That's really cool. Uh, Dr. Quinlan, I know Southside um, Dental has been utilizing this more if you want to speak to that. I can't follow that. <laughs> Good luck. Um, well, we didn't have a teledentistry program previous to COVID. It was brought in uh, so that we would remain accessible during the lockdown. And it's first started out uh, with dentists manning it because they could just then fill their schedule with uh, what most likely would be extractions or the start of endo, or otherwise they would just triage them. Eventually it evolved into having the therapists uh, do the uh, actual exams and try to fill schedules for the dentists with these emergencies. And of course that came about because as people realized that you know, we were available for this type of uh, care, then we were getting more calls obviously. And now it's to the point where it is mostly a dental therapist doing the synchronous exams and uh, some of the asynchronous, uh, well, all the asynchronous are being done by dentists at this point, as far as I know. Uh, but, you know, there's opportunity there to uh, explore how we can use it uh, even more. Christy? Uh, like Heather alluded to, we also have been using it for many, many years on um, the asynchronous. We have hygienists who are actually employed in greater Minnesota and live and work in those communities. Um, for example, Moorhead, which is um, uh, the sister city of Fargo, uh, North Dakota. Uh, we have a hygienist who lives and works up there and, and, and goes into all the schools and she'll take um, intraoral images, she'll take x-rays, she'll do all her clinical notes. And, and when we were at um, full capacity and up and running last year, um, before COVID hit and in previous years, 
Um, usually I probably have about a day a month where I would sit down and literally do tele exams all day long and create treatment plans. And then our staff would take those treatment plans, talk to parents, um, get consent for treatment on a preliminary treatment plan, make sure we have a phone number to reach parents in case there's changes to that treatment plan. And then they would deploy um, providers, generally myself or uh, um, several other, the other therapists up to say Moorhead for a week to, to provide the care that we had already done. And, and what that does is that it would it eliminate the need for us to go up and say, do a week of exams where you're getting very little care done um, and, and really utilize the time we up there to get care, um, you know, restorative care extractions, things of that nature. Um, Cause the hygienist has taken care of all of those um, um, uh, preventive um, um, procedures. Um, what we found during COVID was we did begin to start doing the synchronous, which is something we had never really done before. Um, and, and we're starting to utilize that more and more. And like patient, or like, like Heather said, we're trying to reduce the number of patient contacts as much as possible. So the more of that you can do, the better. And even when my, I go down to Worthington once a week, I usually have a day where I have a, a half a day where I sit down with some of the parents who I know I'm going to see, and we start to do some of those preliminary treatment plans. In fact, that organization has put in money to try and get a mouthwatch camera so that the, the person who just runs the program can try and get me some internal images so we can improve the, uh, the synchronous exams that we're doing um, and get a better idea of what we're getting into before we head down. Very cool. Yeah. Jody? We don't really use teledentistry in our clinic. Um, like I said, private practice. Um, we're just not at that level yet. He's just starting to bring in medical assistance patients, so. <laughs> well, not every clinic is going to need to, you know, know, just like not every clinic needs to hire a dental therapist. There might not be a need just because it passes legislation in the state does not require anyone to hire a dental therapist. We're not made for every clinic. We're not made for every office. So it's just, especially with COVID, it came to light that, hey, dental therapists can help with this too. And advanced dental therapists can help with this too. And this is another way to utilize them and you get to pay us a lot less to do it, so. Nice. Um, yeah, last awesome. questions. And uh, then we're going to go to the Q&A. I know there's some questions in there, so I'll try to get to those. Um, what advice would you give a practice that is considering adding a dental therapist to the practice? Or what advice would you give to another state that is looking at passing legislation or has recently passed legislation? I would like to add also. Um, Christy, do you want to start with that one? I think this was the hardest question because there's so much advice I'd want to give. I already, I already talked about legislation and the things that I would do, right? Everyone's, one of the questions I get, and I'm, I'm sure anyone who goes out there and speaks to dental therapy gets is, what would you change about your own legislation, right? And the number one thing was limited prescription privileges, for sure. I would want a dental therapist, probably want to expand a little bit on, on uh, permanent extractions. I think there's far too many times we encounter a situation where we think it's a tooth that wouldn't really be terribly difficult, especially when you consider taking out KNT, it can be tremendously difficult. Um, and and would, would like to have a little more training in that and be, have the ability to take out more permanent teeth than we do. With that said, um, for someone who's hiring a dental therapist, um, make sure your staff, Dr. Quillen, you talked about it, how you sat down with the staff and you do a PowerPoint with them to really help your staff understand. Because I think that in the beginning, there's too many offices who underutilize their dental therapists because their staff don't fully understand everything that they can do. Um, so, so take that time with your staff to really make sure they understand it. So then we can get everyone working to the top of their license and more and more people get access to care. Awesome. Thank you. Dr. Quillen, do you want to follow up with that? Yeah, I think I would add to that uh, for at least the uh, dentists is to approach it with an open mind find out what it's really all about. A lot of rumor and a lot of uh, roadblocks were put up uh, by the dental community without really knowing what it is the legislation was about, what the purpose of dental therapy was about. So first of all, find out what it's gonna be, uh, how it's gonna be incorporated into the oral health of your state. Then um, understand the legislation so that you get a good idea of you know, what has to be in place to set up a dental therapist in the office. Uh, so yes, that includes the collaborative management agreement that includes what you've researched um, about how it's gonna fit into the program. And then I would suggest making sure you understand what the schools are gonna do. And for the schools that are out of Minnesota, I would highly recommend making sure that the curriculum for dental therapists in their scope of practice is the same as it is for dentists. 
why would you want to uh, compromise the quality of care that your state is um, demanding from the dentist uh, with a dental therapist? It wouldn't make any sense. And as I found, that was the number one thing that convinced me, oh yeah, dental therapy is going to work just fine. Uh, it helped that I knew who the director of the program was at the University of Minnesota, as well as at Metropolitan State, and was able to talk to them and, um, you know, ask them, hey, what's this about? How are you training them? Um, are you getting hard on them, just like I was uh, treated harshly in dental school? So, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I got to go through it, you know. <laughs> I'm still not recovered, but that's another story. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, those are the things that I think uh, would be very helpful. And if you uh, do have a state that there is a great need with the Medicaid population, this is the perfect solution as far as I can see. It's, it's been very helpful and be very open-minded to the things that uh, and the ways it could help. I mean, I just, it just kind of evolved for me and how much better having a therapist in the office was for even my own personal practice. And as a result of that, I'm able to do more of the things that I would rather do. And uh, let's face it, you know, uh, I probably won't be practicing in 10 years. So what I am want to do is a little bit less, you know, these bones do get a little bit creaky. So uh, that's another way that it's a big advantage. It could, it could potentially help uh, prolong a career. Valid point. Uh, Heather, Chandra, anything to add to that? Um, no, you know, I think they both covered it um, fairly well. I would, I would definitely um, agree, kind of keep an open mind and um, really look into it for yourself um, versus some of the misinformation that's out there. If you're, you know, not from the state and you're really looking into it, um, mm -hmm. I will say we have so many, um, you know, people who were anti-dental therapy 12 years ago that now have dental therapists. So I definitely think once you um, experience working with one and what we can and cannot do and that we, you know, see for yourself that we're able to provide, you know, safe quality care um, and how it really can help improve access for your clinic and all of those other, um, you know, benefits that Dr. Quinlan just mentioned. I think that, um, you know, it's just, it's just a benefit for a clinic. Jody. Yeah. Can you guys hear me now yeah. or is, yeah. am I still pretty broken up? Okay. No, no, you're fine. Um, okay. I would say that if you're looking at bringing a therapist in, I think there's enough dentists out there now that have hired therapists and there's enough dentists that have worked with therapists where I would say, call one of your colleagues that have one and talk to them and see what they say. Um, I, I, I really have not run into very many dentists that regret hiring a therapist. And in Southwest Minnesota, like you said, Katie, we have more dentists that want therapists than we have therapists to go. So, um, you know, it, it's, that's something, another thing that you really want to consider is have, making sure that you have the support staff um, because you have to, if you're going to bring in a therapist, um, it's, it's not like hiring a hygienist. You're bringing in another provider. And like you had said in, earlier, we are actually, I think, opening the job market um, for assistants and hygienists. You need them both in order to feed our schedules. So um, that, was one, you know, that was one of the things that in the beginning um, in our clinic, I'm not sure that, that, I mean, he obviously knew I needed an assistant, but, um, making sure that we had the hygiene to feed the schedules for those providers and making sure that, you know, if an assistant needed a day off, we had plenty. And so that would be another thing. Um, yeah, I, um, I do have to say, because I talked with um, Tim before, before I did this and he um, had wanted me to let everyone know that as a private practice dentist in a rural area, he doesn't have any regrets for bringing in a dental therapist. He has, I asked him several times if he could think of roadblocks or anything he would change. And he was like, you're overthinking this, Jody. He said, there's nothing. I have nothing really to talk about. But he did say um, one of the things, and maybe this um, would help other states that are looking at dental therapy, 
one of the things that he um, runs into sometimes when he's trying to explain what I do to a patient is our name. He said, I wish you guys weren't called dental therapists. He said, I wish you were called practitioners. And I told him before I left tonight, I said, Tim, I said, we kind of were in the beginning. That's what we, you know, that's what, in fact, that's what my master's is in. And he said, you know, it would just be so much easier because the people just know what a practitioner, they know nurse practitioners. So he said, when I say therapist, I always have to explain that they're not helping your mental health and they're not there to counsel. Oh, yes, they are. Literally what I get every single day. You know, but uh, yeah, I talked to so that makes me feel better. I'm afraid Katie's going to build me one of these days. So. (laughs) That was the only thing he said um, that he, he wishes was different. Um, I know that sometimes um, he, he, and other, I've worked with other dentists too, that the, um, you know, the quality assurance part of the CMA and making, making the dentist sit down and go over the chart reviews and the chart audits. Um, he, he's not crazy about that, um, but, but we do it and it's just part of the job. And um, yeah, he, there, there isn't really a downside. We really haven't run into um, a lot of negatives at all. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, we're called dental therapists in like 50 other countries in the world. So they were thinking about dental nurse and a whole bunch of other names were thrown out there and they just decided to stick with it. So it just wasn't, I mean, it's been around longer than almost hygiene now. So um, yeah, that was interesting. And don't forget, there are just a ton of resources available. Um, I don't know if, si, if you could post that slide if you have um, with the contact information. Please look at the Minnesota Dental Therapy Association's website. You can email us. We get questions every week from people from out of state. We can get you resources. We can get you to the people that you need to like answer questions, whether it's on legislation and starting dental therapy. Um, I talked to two offices, clinics this week about incorporating a dental therapist. I've started dental therapy in a few different clinics. So there's a lot of resources out there for you if you're interested in even just learning about dental therapy. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out and email or just contact us in any way. Um, a lot of resources for you. So, um, we're getting close here to eight 30. You should have received your CE, um, through the email. If you haven't, please let us know. I'm going to start going through the Q and a, but for anybody on the panel or for any of our amazing attendees, we had almost 30 attendees tonight, which was awesome. Very, very, very grateful for that. Thank you all for coming. Um, if you need to leave, I know it's getting late for 30, but I will stay on and answer as many of the QA questions as I can. Um, if not, I'm going to try to get um, the information and uh, Joe and I can work on getting um, back to you personally. Uh, Can you speak about the processes and challenges you faced once dental therapy was passed and we're working to get implemented implemented with the the dental therapy board? Um, As far as I remember, the Minnesota Board of Dentistry was on board. Um, They were pretty involved even with the legislative process, I think. I don't remember the board really having a big issue um, with dental therapy in the beginning, the board itself, Christy. The, the board itself really uh, attempted to stay as neutral as possible yeah. um, and not wanting to interject. It was really a legislative process. Um, uh, so it was really the legislature who took the lead on that and kind of pushed dentist, dentistry into creating some kind of a, a compromise. Um, but no, the board itself stayed pretty neutral. Um, so, Yeah, and then otherwise a collaborative, bleh, 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 collaborative management agreement, I would say was kind of the first hurdle that I had with the board but that got figured out fairly quickly and isn't an issue fairly quickly yeah there was some misunderstanding with the legislation that they needed to be approved by the board um and really they didn't need to be approved by the board they just needed to be filed with the board just so they knew who they were collaborating with and there were yeah you're right there was a little back and forth on that and and finally the board conceded that yes indeed it just needed to be filed with the board and it didn't need to be approval the first um cmas that were coming in the board was saying you need to change this and this and they're like well actually this is an agreement between the dentist and the therapist you really can't tell us what we need to have in it and, and and it worked out fine but those are those little i mean when you look back over 10 years of practice the little teeny hurdles i mean in the comparison to the big scope of getting legislation passed and getting people practitioners out there not a big deal awesome um as there's a question about the adt um ms program starting at um minnesota state university mankato I actually don't know a lot of 
about that. I, um, I can I can speak to that. I went down there and actually did their accreditation um, evaluation. So. <laughs> Um, when uh, Metropolitan State University and the University of Minnesota first started their programs, obviously CODA did not do accreditation at that time. Um, so the State Board of Minnesota accredited both programs after com doing a complete review. It's much like a, CRO a CODA accreditation review that we do. Um, and we just went down this summer and did um, Mankato State and they actually have accreditation through the Board of Dentistry now. That is why their program can start this fall despite the fact that they do not have CODA approval. They are working on it. Um, Alaska has been granted approval from CODA, so they are now officially the first ACOTA approved program in the country. So if anyone says none of the programs are accredited, that is no longer true. Um, Metropolitan State University, I believe, just submitted theirs. The University of Minnesota has submitted theirs. They both have site visits coming. And uh, um, Mankato State, it's not called Mancy, I'm sorry, Minnesota State University. It'll always forever be Mankato State to me because um, I'm of a certain age. <laughs> um, they will be also <laughs> submitting um, their, theirs, I believe, in, 20, in 2021 this year. Um, so you will see very quickly um, three more programs um, become CODA approved, um, but currently Alaska is the only one. I suspect the next one will be the University of Minnesota followed by Metro State, followed by Maine, Minnesota State. Which is gonna be awesome because I see some legislation yeah. in other states saying that as long as a dental therapist has graduated from a CODA accredited program, um, I don't know yep. if past graduates are gonna get grandfathered in or like how that's gonna work. I know I've had that question before, I have no idea. But um, we'll have to see how we'll have to see how that goes. And and, yeah. and just as a side note, because a lot of people always talk about dual licensure and hygiene. Um, in Minnesota, both Metropolitan State and Mankato, um, Minnesota State, um, they they require a hygienist to get into their program. And the University of Minnesota is a dual track, dual license program. So every graduate in the state of Minnesota will come out dual licensed and has since 2016. Yes. So what um, Heather and I are correct. No, not me. Just me. Just me on this panel. Just you. Just you. I, I will not exist one. anymore. It will not be a thing. And I think a lot of states are following. Well, you'll always well. exist, but <laughs> what I am will not. Um, yeah. And a lot of states are following that model, which I think is um, kind of something yeah. important to know. We do get that question a lot. So, um, is the encounter rate in an FQHC the same for all providers, dentists versus DT versus DDS? I think we answered this. I see as many patients in a day as a, a dentist does and a hygienist does. So the encounter rates are fairly similar, Dr. Quinlan. Yeah, they're, they're all the same. There isn't a difference. Yep. Um, oh, what is the job market like for men in Minnesota for dental therapists? Are we in demand? For those working in nonprofits, are you being recruited by private practices? Um, I spoke to this earlier. There's currently more open positions than there are dental therapists available. Part of the reason is our um, class sizes are very small. There's only seven at a time right now at the University of Minnesota. I'm on the admissions board there. And I think um, there's only five with, at the other school, five or six at a time. Metropolitan, Metropolitan State has six at a time. And um, Minnesota State University, I believe, will have 12. Oh, nice. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. So, so there you go. That will, should help. Will, that should help a lot. There will be some people who will be happy to get some graduates in a couple of years. Yeah, and it, it's kind of important to know that the admissions process, it's very competitive. There's very mm -hmm. limited spots. And I've been on the admission board at the U for, um, I don't know, seven years now. And the amount of applications and just the quality of applicants we get is, is amazing. So it's um, very, very, very cool to see we're starting that process again this year. Um, one of the criticisms of dental therapy in other states is there are already too many dentists who are not busy. Why do we need more providers? How would you respond to that? It sounds like all of us and our supervising dentists are pretty busy. Um, I can uh, maybe address some of that. Uh, just seeing, hearing some of those roadblocks initially and how dental therapy actually came about. Won't claim to be the expert, but... As I understand it, um, there is still uh, a lot of uh, offices that just are not taking the Medicaid. So these dentists may not be busy, but they're also not taking the Medicaid. And when you have this therapy program set up so that they are to help the Medicaid population and the people that are 200% or below of poverty level and sliding fee for an FQHC, um, or anybody actually can go in, but uh, that's one of the reasons that therapy is needed. And certainly I'm 
Um, I can understand the business model of a dentist where the reimbursement rates are so low that it's not worth it for them to do it. I get that. I understand it. And that's their choice. If they want to bring people in to make that up or to stay busy, whatever, that's up to them. Uh, they are independent uh, people and that, that's just fine. But um, if, you know, if those people need care, obviously we're finding it's not there with the private practices. And it's interesting to know that more than 50% of the dental therapists are working in private practice. Um, actually almost 60% of us are in private practice. The rest of us are in like a mix of the nonprofit larger group practices and um, hospitals and schools. So it's a definitely a mix. A lot of people think we're not in private practice, but we are. So um, Jody or Heather, anything to add or Christy to that? No. Okay. Go ahead, Heather. Oh, I was just gonna say, I mean, when you are working in public health or in a rural area, um, where there is a shortage of dental providers. I mean, to we're just, we're overwhelmingly busy. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, overwhelmingly busy. <laughs> there's, there's nothing else that can, I, that I can really think to say, except for that. There's very, very little sitting around. Well, and even up in uh, Cook County, Minnesota, you know, Grand Marais, they've, you know, tried to get dentists up there. They've tried and tried and tried. And now I think we've had like two or three um, DTs or ADTs up there. So it's often that we can't get the dentist, you know, we can't get dentists like up there, down there, wherever and stuff like that. So um, that's been, and it's also important to know that there's also been studies that have showed that you can increase your production in your practice. A great case is up in Montevideo, Minnesota, which is very rural Minnesota. He went from like one practice that was like, I think under like a million dollars to well over that within a two years, just implementing dental therapy. He opened another clinic, still seeing state-based insurance. So it's, um, you know, it can also be profitable for your practice also just incorporating another provider. And again, it's important to know that 50% of the dental therapist patients have to be under that restriction, not the clinics it does not have to be 50%. That's another common misconception. So Dr. Uh, yeah, one of the other things too, is that some of the, uh, the culture of dentistry had been that to say that we don't need dental therapy, all the states need to do is increase the reimbursement rate. And that's been a battle that's been going on for a long time, turned into a stalemate. We have dental therapy. The states just are not going to increase reimbursement rates. They've shown that time and time again. And now in the environment we're in with COVID, um, I'm just glad we even have the, the, the Medicaid um, program still. Yes. Very, very true. I don't know if Chrissy can speak to that. I think they've, we've actually tried to increase reimbursement in the past and it didn't do anything so many times patient population so many times yeah it's it's yeah. it's a constant battle and you know minnesota has some big generosities in that i know like like katie alluded to earlier there's so many states that give zero benefits to any adults period um and 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 we're very good at giving those benefits to children and pregnant women and, and we do have some adult benefits which is uncommon but the reimbursement rates, yeah, it's it's very difficult to entice a private practice dentist um, to be don't willing to see them. those patients. Really uh, you, you can't. I, I mean, it's it's a it's a financial loss um, if you try and incorporate those patients sometimes into your practice. Um, you certainly are doing it for philanthropic reasons. So, yeah, and, and like you said, though, it, when you mix in that fifty percent, um, I think most practices see an increase in profitability overall. Um, but that the states are never going to reimburse at that rate. And there's, they've even shown studies though, where states have improved the reimbursement rate and you get a nice bump at the beginning and then eventually it trails off. You know, as we all know, there's other complications that go into low reimbursement rates. It's, it's a, it's a challenging population to work with at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to manage, um, there's a higher fail rate also, so just as a clinic, you have to be ready to manage a lot of that. And dental therapy can help too, just with schedule flexibilities and having another yeah. provider there to help, you know, the patient that comes 20, 30 minutes late. I mean, it's a, you know, five-year-old not going to punish the kid, you know, for being 20 minutes yep. late. So you're going to do what you can do and try to get as much done as you can in one visit when you got them in the chair. So, um, anything else to add to that? Anybody? I just want to say that working with um, working with Tim, you know, he, like I said, had an established 
established practice when I came and he envisioned, I, I think a lot of the rural dentists that I know, cause I know a lot of them and they want to help. They want to do something and dental therapy for them is a, is a way to help. And I also work for a dentist in Tracy and, um, and I, I've done lunch and learns for a lot of rural dentists in this area. And um, I think that's where the interest in dental therapy is. And, and for Tim, he was just, you know, wanting to give back to the community. And he, he said this to me many, many times. This was his opportunity to give back a little bit. So he hired me and I, I see all of, all of the patients that he's, he's opened his doors to quite a few more. And, um, and, and yeah, we've had things that we've had to try and work out and me being dual licensed helps because when we do have that fail, um, a lot of times with us being behind in hygiene, they can pop a hygiene in my schedule. And so it works out. Um, but I, I do want to say in defense of the private practice dentists, there, there's quite a few of them that, um, would like to see this option because it, it gives them a chance to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I obviously just coming out of school and just starting you have student loans. I mean, that's, that's not possible either, you know, right. so it's, and again, we're not made for every practice. So it's not, there's, there's still plenty of the general patient population that needs access to care. So, uh, can a DT be one of the associate dentists? I mean, no, I, never really been asked that question. So Christy. The state of Minnesota requires a dentist to own a dental practice. Yeah. The only real exception to that is a dentist who's passed away. The spouse has a, you know, an amount of time where they can sell the practice or um, nonprofits, right? Nonprofits run in a whole different functioning kind of way, but there's never a scenario where a dental therapist could own part of a practice or be be part ownership in a practice or, or be an associate within a practice. We, we are not, a, a dentist has to own a practice in the state of Minnesota. Other state laws, my, I, that would be maybe different in other places, but there, there's no way in which we could own a practice at this point in time. Yeah. When I just had a practice again, contact me, they're like, we lost our second associate dentist. They left to open their own clinic. We're really looking at the dental therapy option, you know, like, is this an option? And they you know, saw the patient population, it's just like, yes, this, this is an option, you know, we can't leave and open our own practice and do that. So, um, and I mean, if you have a dentist that only wants to work, you know, three days a week, and you have a DT or ADT, you know, they can help run, you know, the clinic the other two days a week. So it's, it's a great. Correct. And, and for a dentist who's getting older and, and wants to do that, I understand they prefer to get a, an associate in there, right, who could eventually buy out their practice. But this could be a wonderful addition to the practice, and actually could probably in some many ways, attract in, right? Because your bottom line is going to increase and it could make it, make your, your practice look much more um, appealing to an associate dentist to come in and eventually buy. And like you said, Katie, you can, you could cut down to one day a week. You, you don't, you don't need to be working a lot if you have an ADT doing the, the bulk of, bulk of the work. So. Correct. Yes. Actually, we made it through all the questions. So yay. I'm very, very excited. That was amazing. Thank you panel for doing this. I'm sorry I bugged you for so many weeks, but thank you. I, I, it looked like it paid off. We had a lot of great questions. We had a um, few people from our state and everything. So this was amazing. Um, thank you for all the attendees that came on. I'm going to end this now. Um, I don't know if I can uh, put up my contact information here for anybody that wants it at the end, but I know anyone can reach out at the U too, or I can put it in the chat here also. No, but anyway, so thank you attendees. Thank you panelists. Feel free to log off at any time. And as always, like we're here, we're available. Dental therapy is real. It's working in Minnesota. Yay. <laughs> Great job. Thank you so Thank much. You. Have a wonderful night. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Everyone. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you.